We have been studying this year the book of John, and about once a month we usually come together and talk about two chapters of the book of John, and today I will be talking about John chapter 18, the night before Jesus' death. These are all of the events that John records occur before Jesus is actually crucified, and that's what we're going to discuss in this lesson. And because it's such a lengthy chapter, that will serve as our introduction. This is what we're going to talk about, and so let's get into it. Chapter 18 begins with betrayal, arrest, and facing. Let's begin with the betrayal. When I study John 18, I begin in verse 1, as anyone would need to do, and the Bible starts to tell me about what has happened. Jesus has spoken these words. It ends the section between about verse, chapter 13 and chapter 17. There's been this lengthy type of conversation that Jesus has been having with his disciples, and it's been continuing all the way up till now. He's finally finished it. He goes out with his disciples over to the book, Brook Kidron, and, when there was a, and there was a garden, and his disciples had entered. It appears that Gethsemane, which is where we are, was a frequent place to visit. Why do I say that? Well, Judas, who betrayed them, and betrayed him, Jesus, that is, in verse 2, he knew also of this place. If I were to say, we're going to go to a barbecue restaurant this afternoon, most of you would think, if we were coming here, about the hut. If I said, let's go to a barbecue restaurant, the hut would probably be one of the first places it comes to your mind. It's a frequent place that a lot of us like to visit. And so if I said, where can we go get barbecue, you would probably tell me, well, let's go to the hut. This seems to be the idea here behind Gethsemane. It was a frequent place that was visited by Jesus and his disciples. And so if you had asked Judas, where would they most likely be? I've got an idea. They're probably at Gethsemane. And typically when we talk about Gethsemane, we, we have a lot of times acted as though this was the first time they ever went there. It doesn't appear that that's the case. It appears this was a frequent place for Jesus to go with his disciples and to pray. And when I study about John 18, I see that the men arrest Jesus. And I, I want to ask this question as we, before we read it. Did the men really know who Jesus was? I want you to pick up with me in verse 3. Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? Who do you look for? Who are you wanting? And they answered and said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, stood with them. Now when he had said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What does the Bible tell you or tell me that Jesus had done that would cause them to fall to the ground? Had he started to fight them with some type of, of mixed martial arts and trying to save his life? Was he trying to perform a miracle upon them and he caused them to be forced to the ground? He said three words, I am he, I'm who you're seeking, and this caused them to fear and fall backward. It was such a shock to them that this was Jesus of Nazareth, or that they had the knowledge of who Jesus was and what he had done, that they fell backward and they had to ask, be asked again by Jesus, who are you seeking? Because you look at verse 7, Jesus tries to wake them up and say, who are you seeking? You know, Jesus could have used this opportunity to try to get away. These soldiers had fallen back to the ground. Isn't that a good time to try to run? Isn't that a good time to try to flee? He could have tried that. But instead, I find this incredibly interesting, he prompts them to wake up and arrest him. He asks them a second time, who are you seeking? And they said, well, J Jesus of Nazareth. So I've told you already that I'm he, therefore if you seek me, you let these go their way. Let my disciples go. You take me. I find that incredible. Jesus could have tried to get away. He could have tried to utilize that moment of time 
And do we really want to suggest it was outside of the realm of possibility that Jesus could have just disappeared from their presence? He could have. And that would have been a perfect time to do it. But he didn't. He prompts them, hey, wake up, you're supposed to arrest me. Have you ever been at a school play and some kid forgets their lines and so someone kind of prompts them with their lines to try to keep the play going? You're supposed to say such and such. You're supposed to do such and such here. It's as if Jesus is saying to them, hey, you're supposed to arrest me here. You're supposed to take me and arrest me and, and lead me to my, my death, my crucifixion. You need to wake up because we've got something to do. And as horrendous and horrible as this death would be for Jesus, he was more than willing to go through with it. Then we have the arrest occur in verses 10 and following, where Simon Peter, famously, we talk about this a lot, he draws a sword and he struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear, and that servant's name was Malchus. John gives us this information. Malchus's right ear has now been cut off, and Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? And the detachment of troops and the captain of the, and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Now, we're not told in this section of Scripture that Jesus repaired the ear of Malchus, but we know from other accounts that that's what he did. Would that not have been a good time for Jesus to go away? Or to try to utilize that miracle as an excuse to keep him alive. See what I've done? Can't you tell that I'm the son of God? His ear was clearly cut off and I just restored it. He simply restores it and then waits for the arrest to take place. I want to talk about some things though that I know some, some people have stated that this was Peter's mistake. Not that he drew his sword to protect Jesus, but that he drew his sword, period. Some have suggested that Peter's problem was he was not a pacifist. I want to put one thing before you before we get into the rest of these, but then why did he have a sword in the first place? If he was, a, if he was supposed to be a pacifist, if he was supposed to be someone that never picked up a sword and he was following Jesus, why would Jesus have allowed him to have a sword? But I want to give you some reasons that I believe it's not that he struck Malchus's ear. That's not the mistake. I'm going to present to you the reason, and based on what I've studied and what I find in Scripture, I'm going to present to you what I believe the Scriptures are teaching here from what they say. Number one, God had justified protection of oneself from threats. When you study through the Old Testament, you could begin in Deuteronomy 20, verses 1 through 4, where the Bible says, when you go out to battle against your enemies, there you go, I could stop right there. You can protect yourself from a threat. Because when you go out to battle against your enemies, that indicates that the Lord is approving of a battle here. He's okay with fighting if it is to protect oneself. But he goes on to say... You see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you. Don't be afraid. It's not that the Lord is justifying the battle here and just says, look, I'm rooting for you. I hope you win. You know, many fans this afternoon are going to gather in stadiums and they're going to watch their teams play and they're going to hope the other wins, but they're not going to have a single thing to do with the outcome. Many people will sit in their chair and their couch this afternoon and they're going to turn the TV on and they're going to turn on their sports and they're going to watch teams and they're going to want one team to win but they're not going to have anything to do with the outcome. They're rooting for them. They want them to do well. That's not what the Lord's doing here. The Lord didn't turn on his proverbial TV and say, how's Israel doing today? Oh, come on, Israel, you can fight better than that. No, the Lord says this in verse 1. Do not be afraid for them. Why? The Lord your God is with you. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that God influenced the battle that happened? Yes. So then God was absolutely condoning of violence for protection of oneself. Yes. But I could keep going. If you look at 1 Samuel 25 and verse 13, David, which we call a man after God's own heart, tells his men, 
Each man gird on his sword. Take your swords. We've got to go. If the Lord's a pacifist, if the Lord does not condone protection of oneself, why could David, a man after God's own heart, say, everyone take your swords, we've got to go? I then need to think about the second thing, though, that not every death is considered a murder. Not every death is considered a murder. And I do not like the, the translations with Exodus that say, thou shalt not kill. That's not what the Lord is saying there. Because if he really is saying, thou shalt not ever kill, then the Lord himself broke that commandment when he told King Saul, you go and utterly destroy the Amalekites. Kill them. The Lord's really saying there, thou shalt not murder. Murder. But not every death is considered a murder. There's a distinction made when you study through Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 5. The Bible says, as when a man goes to the woods with his neighbor to cut timber. And as the people are cutting timber, his hand swings a stroke of the axe to cut down the tree. But the head slips from the handle and strikes his neighbor in such a way that it kills him. And he dies. He shall flee to one of these cities and live. He didn't mean to kill this man, but he died nonetheless. But it wasn't a murder. We're not told that with Cain and Abel, though. We're told Cain murdered his brother. He struck his brother down to kill him, and the Lord was not pleased with him for what he did. There's a distinction made between these two passages. There is taking the life accidentally. You're out cutting wood, and you, you go to swing that axe back, and the head just detaches from the handle and slices into somebody and takes their life. And there's taking the axe and putting it into somebody's body to take their life. And the Lord makes a distinction here. But then the Bible tells me in the New Testament that every soul must be subject, Romans 13, 1 through 7, to the government. And when you study through this, it's whoever resists the authority, verse 2, resists the ordinance of God. The rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil, verse 3. Do you want to be afraid of the authority? Do you want to be unafraid? Do what's good. You'll have praise for the same. If you want to stay out of their... Their bad side, just do the right thing and you'll be okay. What does it then continue to say? He is God's minister, verse 4, to you for good. If you, do, if you do evil, what? Be afraid. He does not bear the sword in vain. There's capital punishment involved here. He does not bear the sword in vain. This is not murder when someone's life is taken because they have broken the law in such a way that they are justified in having their life taken. This is not considered murder. The Lord says, this individual, the government, they don't bear the sword in vain in that situation. I've given them the right to, to protect yourself. But then thirdly on this, if God allowed the children to fight, then we today are supposed to protect ourselves as well. If we can. When you study Numbers 31 and verse 3, Moses spoke to the people and said, Arm some of yourselves for war and let them go against the Midianites. If God allowed his chosen people to fight to protect themselves, can I see then a parallel when I study 1 Peter 2, 9, where it tells me that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood? We are God's chosen people. And that God wants us to value our lives and our family the same as another but then we don't typically talk about this verse in this regard. But 1 Timothy 5, 8, I do believe, applies in this situation. The Bible says there, If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. When you look at that word provide, it's pronoeo in the Greek. It's this mentality that says you think ahead. And you think ahead in such a way that you are thinking of any possible situation where your family will not be provided for, will not be taken care of, and you take care of that for them. Does this not then convey someone trying to take their lives that I as a husband and a father need to consider that and be prepared for that? Can I present to you this morning that the sin, or the mistake really, was not that Peter took a sword to strike Malchus's ear but that he was trying to keep Jesus from going to the cross. 
If Malchus had been successful, and he wouldn't have been, he wasn't, I don't think he was aiming for the ear, okay? He was a fisherman, but not somebody that would have normally handled a sword, so I don't think he's necessarily aiming to take the ear off. But if he had successfully fought off all those guards, would Jesus have gone to the cross? I don't think he would have. And I don't think that's what was supposed to happen to you. The Lord tells G Peter, put away your sword. This is supposed to happen. He's betrayed. He's arrested. And at, at the beginning of this, the disciples, they're trying to fight for him. But the other accounts of the gospel tell me they all forsake him and flee. But then he goes to face Annas and Caiaphas. And you have him before these men. And, and the Bible tells me in John eleven forty eight 48 through 50, that is Caiaphas who first suggests putting Jesus to death. That it's him who first suggests, hey, you know what? We should kill this individual. And this is not all that happens to Jesus tonight. In this night. Because we have a second point, which is the first denial of Peter and the high priest questions. When you look at the first denial, you have Peter going through this situation and it doesn't look like there was any type of interrogation that caused Peter to deny the Lord. If you watch TV, you watch some of these cop shows or these CSI type investigative shows and sometimes one of the good guys gets caught or captured. And typically speaking, you will see, especially in some type of secret agent type movie, a 007 type movie, some torture given out because they want to try to figure out the plan of the good people. And so they torture and torture and torture and sometimes an individual breaks. After an, an, an immense amount of torture and a, an intense amount of torture, they finally just say, okay, I've had enough, I'll tell you. But when you read... John 18, 16, Peter standing outside at the door and the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. But a servant girl who kept the door says to Peter, you're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? I'm not, no. Why is it that he so quickly denied the Lord? Well, number one, Jesus did tell him that that was what was going to happen. And if the Lord tells you something's going to happen, you can take it to the bank. But can I submit to you that when you study the gospel accounts and the book of Acts, there's something lacking in the gospel accounts that you no longer see in the book of Acts. Conviction. No, they were convicted enough to follow the Lord. I understand that. But it took him dying and being risen from the dead for them to say, we're willing to die for this man. And that's exactly what happens in the book of Acts. Peter's the same one in Acts 5 who says, we ought to obey God rather than men. So we're not going to listen to you. We're still going to go out into the temple and we're going to preach and we're going to proclaim the Lord as the Savior. Would he have done that in this chapter? It doesn't appear that he would have. Conviction is now found in, in the book of Acts. But currently, I don't think you see the conviction. He denies the Lord almost immediately. At least how the text puts it. And then you have the high priest questioning Jesus. And he asks him about his disciples and his doctrine. And Jesus answers and says, I spoke openly to the world. I, I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I've said nothing. So why do you ask me? Can't you know? Haven't I done it in such an open way? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. Basically, Jesus is saying, I've lived in such an open way that there's no real reason for anyone to have a question about who I am or what I think. We do that in certain ways, but not in everything. I can tell you, and you can probably say things about me that you know because I've opened up to you. You could even suggest by the way I'm dressed today. Well, he obviously likes the color purple. He's wearing it. And a lot of people don't wear colors they don't like. So we could make an assumption then that he at least is fond of the color purple. I've not even made that proclamation to you, but you can deduce it, can't you? 
Or he loves this gray suit. I've seen him wear it more than any other suit. And I'll tell you, I do love this gray suit. It's my favorite. We can even do this without saying anything. But Jesus is saying, I'm not secretive about anything. I said everything openly. So go ask some of the people. And I really believe here that Jesus is saying, you yourself should know what I've said because I've been in the synagogue and I've been in the temple. Aren't you supposed to be involved in those areas? Aren't you the high priest? Aren't you supposed to kind of know those types of things? Couldn't you yourself know who I am? And the high priests, one of the servants, the officers, hears this and strikes Jesus. And says to him, do you answer the high priest like that? How dare you blaspheme the high priest? Some have suggested that the Jewish high priest may be the man of sin that Paul is referring to. And I think there may be merit to that. Because yes, the Jewish high priest sat on a throne and acted as God. And pretended in such a way that he had this God complex about himself. That he is the standard. Oh, I'm I'm somebody. And so much so that the officers would have struck Jesus in saying, How dare you speak to the Jewish high priest like that? You know what? They should have turned around and slapped that high priest and said, How dare you speak to our Lord like that? But that's not what's going to happen. This is a one-sided battle tonight. That it looks like Jesus isn't going to win. But in reality, us as Christians, we know he's winning. Because we're winning. And with every blow and everything that's going to happen to him, he'll be okay. We'll be okay because of it. Number three, you have a final denying and then Pilate. In this final denying, when Peter is finally discussing this again, someone says, you're not also one of his disciples, are you? I'm not, no. Well, didn't we see you in the garden? Didn't we see you with him? Peter denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. What was his reaction when that rooster crowed? I I don't know. The, The scripture doesn't tell me what his facial expression was. The Bible does say that he went out and wept bitterly. Other translation or other accounts of the gospel talk about that Jesus and Peter come face to face when this happens. That the Lord looked upon Peter. And then Peter realizes, I did the very thing I promised I'd not do. What was his facial expression though? I don't know, but I've often wondered what it was. And I've often wondered whether it gave this mentality of, I have failed my Lord. Other than in the book of Galatians, where Paul says he withstood Peter to the face, from all that I have studied and read, this is one of the last times you ever see Peter make a mistake that is recorded in Scripture. Now in Galatians, you do have Paul saying, I withstood Peter to the face, but can I make a suggestion? Could it be said then that Peter made... An absolute diligence to not stumble, but that it also tells me that we still can, even though we're trying as hard as we we tell we say things all the time like Peter had foot and mouth syndrome. Because so many times when Peter said something, Jesus is either correcting him or he's saying, Get behind me, Satan, or he's telling him, No, the, the devil wants to sift you as wheat. But you don't really see that occurring much after this. Other than in Galatians when Paul says, I withstood Peter to the face because he was to be blamed. Maybe today some of us in here are like Peter and we need to make this change and understand, hey, we've made mistakes and it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but we can make a decision today that this is the last time we're going to be known for doing this on a regular basis. When you get to Pilate, for time's sake, I want you to just think about this as we're going to just talk about what occurs. First, Pilate's question. He asks the individuals who are bringing Jesus, look, what accusation are you bringing with this man? You're bringing me an individual, but what are you accusing him of? And they then play a game of hot potato, if you will. You remember the game hot potato, right? You get this hot potato, at least this idea of you have a hot potato in your hands. It's a ball or something, and you have to try to keep passing it to someone else. You don't want to keep it. And there have even actually been games of this where if you hold on to it too long, you lose. 
That seems what happens here because they said, well, look, if he were not an evildoer, we wouldn't have given him to you. Hey, Pilate, you take him. We don't want him. And Pilate said, well, you take him and judge him. I don't want him. And then they said again, look, it's not lawful for us to put him to death. You take him. And so Pilate keeps him. And he begins to question Jesus. And he asks him questions such as, are you king of the Jews? And Jesus answers and says, are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Are you asking or have you heard from others? Pilate says, well, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Second question. Jesus says, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. Peter, put your sword away. We're not fighting for an earthly kingdom. We're fighting for a heavenly one. I don't have to worry about this world with my kingdom. It's not of this world. They would fight so that I should be, not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom's not from here. And Pilate says, well, wait a minute. Third question, are you a king then? You say rightly that I am a king for this cause I was born and for this cause I've come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Fourth question by Pilate, what is truth? What an amazing series of questions here. What is truth? First it was, what have you done? And now Pilate's saying, Jesus, will you tell me what truth is? What is truth? Now the, the text doesn't tell me that he stuck around, st stuck around for the answer. He goes out and he says to the Jews, I find no fault in him at all. But then he cowers. He says in verse 39, even though I don't find a fault with him, you know, you've got a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Other accounts tell me that he also brought forth Barabbas in this. Which do you want, Barabbas or Jesus? John 18.40 tells me they all cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. John tells me that Barabbas was a robber. And that doesn't sound, well, okay, maybe he just made a mistake and he, he robbed something. Maybe he's desperate for money. But when one studies the other gospel accounts to get the clearest picture of Jesus' life that they can get while he was on earth, you discover this. In Mark 15, 7, Mark records about Barabbas that there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. So I can now say that he's a robber and a murderer. And the Jewish people are calling for him to be released. Why? Because other accounts tell me that they were so bloodthirsty that they didn't care what happened to Jesus as long as he died. And they didn't care who was free. I don't know what happened with Barabbas after that, but I... I like Peter, have often wondered about Peter's expression. I've often wondered, did Barabbas commit any more rebellious acts and murder? And you think the people wondered, maybe if we hadn't let him go, this wouldn't have happened? You ever watch the, like I've talked about in this, this sermon, the, the cop shows where someone gets off on a technicality and then they go out and kill somebody else. And the police officer who knew that it was this person, they had him dead to rights, but they just didn't have enough tells the person, this is your fault that this happened because you let him go. Could have been said to the Jewish people, it's your fault if Barabbas ever did commit another murderous act, this is on you. But they wouldn't have cared. Let's apply this text together. As we look to put application in this mentality of John 18, how can we do that? Number one, even the followers of Jesus can stumble because Peter denied and Judas betrayed. And they were the twelve of the twelve. Number two, Jesus was illegally tried and went through that for me. The Jews even admitted that. And they had already questioned Jesus when they tried to give him over to Pilate. But if, and if you want this information, I can give you. But there were seven things that were done illegally to Jesus that night. That could not have been done. I'll give you just a few. 
Number one, arrest could not have been made at night. Number two, Jesus was not permitted a defense. He was not even given a lawyer, if you will, to argue his case. And finally, the Sanhedrin itself, it pronounced the death sentence, which it was not authorized to do. Number three, leaders can be cowards, especially if it means saving themselves. Pilate looks for at least a little bit when you read this as a man who's going to do the right thing. I find no fault in him. He's a good man. I'm not going to do anything to him. But then he cowers because other versions inform me, Mark 15, 15, that he was willing to consent to the people and therefore said, you choose who you want to take. Finally, even in the midst of his final hours, Jesus was focused on the church and its understanding that it would save mankind. My kingdom is not of this world. That's the church. If everyone today in every church assembly was killed, the church would still not be destroyed. Because you cannot kill something that is spiritual. Only the Lord has that ability. Because the text tells me in the scriptures that I don't need to fear man who can destroy body, but I need to fear the Lord who can destroy both body and soul. The only one who has the ability to actually destroy our souls isn't going to do it if we're a part of his kingdom. And really, I would submit to you that we would be destroying our souls if we die lost. You cannot destroy the church because it's not in this world. It's a spiritual place, a spiritual kingdom. And as long as this earth stands, the church will always be a factor. But we have a responsibility to continue to make it a factor in our community. I study John and I find that the cross equals a great love that Jesus has for me and for you. Because as much as you and I say we love each other, I don't know if either one of us would be willing to go through all of that for us. Oh, we'll take a bullet for you, sure. But an excruciating death? I don't know. I know a lot of us would like to say, yeah, we would do that. And the disciples, all of them said, we won't deny you, Lord, but the Bible tells me that they all forsook Jesus and fled. So what then am I to suggest but that Jesus has had a horrible last night on earth? Imagine the exhaustion that he feels. And we're not even to Calvary yet. Imagine, as Luke tells us, the hematidrosis, the bursting of the capillaries, and all of the things that happened to Jesus that would have made his skin more tender and more susceptible to injury and more pain, and we're not even to Calvary yet. Has he suffered greatly already for us? I can honestly tell you I've never had a night as bad as this night. And I hope I never do. But boy, if this doesn't show us the incredible love that Jesus has for us, and we're not even to Calvary. Perhaps you're here today and you desire to become a child of God because of the suffering and sacrifice that Jesus made for you and for me. You can. That death that's about to happen that we're going to discuss in the second service was for everybody, is for everybody. And we can become children of God if we hear the word, believe it, confess the Lord as our Savior, and that we believe He's the Son of God and we are His, repenting of the sins that we have in our lives and being baptized for the remission of our sins. Perhaps you've done that, but you've wandered away. Won't you decide right now to make your life right, like Peter did, to rededicate yourself to the Lord and come back to Him as together we stand and sing?